प्रवीण जी ऐसी कोई मैकेनिज्म नहीं है जहां पे हाउ मेनी आर अटेंडिंग ये वाला कॉलम ना दिखे ओ वेबिनार में है सर वो एक्चुअली अच्छा शाल वी स्टार्ट सर लेट्स वेट फॉर अनदर टू थ्री मिनट्स ऑलरेडी फिफ्टी टू पीपल आर ऑन द वेटिंग लिस्ट बोलो आशीष करें शुरू हाँ जी मैडम आ रहा इशू चलो कोई बात नहीं आप आप सुन पा रहे हो हमारे को आप सुन पा रहे हो अच्छा बट आप यू आर नॉट एबल टू कम्युनिकेट हो जाते हाँ नहीं आ रही हाँ जी अच्छा कोई बात नहीं कोई बात नहीं मीटिंग में तो ज्वाइन कराना शुरू कर देते कर दो तो ये जी मीटिंग में तो ज्वाइन करा दीजिए सर आपको उनको बोलना पड़ेगा कोई मीटिंग में ज्वाइन कराने में आप म्यूट पे हो रवीन जी अपन कर ले एडमिट अब ज्वाइन हो गए सर ज्वाइन दिस सर एडमिट किया सर Yes, sir. Good to go. Uh, good morning. Uh, uh, I would rather say respected uh, life members of Indian Society of Radiology uh, and uh, and the faculty. Uh, 
it's really hard thing uh, to see before we we get into into the program per se it's really hard thing to see uh, so many of life members uh, on a single platform to be honest with you you know we have been doing all these conferences and conventions all these years uh, rarely have we actually found uh, so many of life members you know together on one platform uh, trying to interact and trying to trying to learn few things and the process you know give some of the inputs also uh, which essentially goes on to say that that the topic that has been chosen for today probably uh, is is a topic which which is the need uh, of the day for for all of us uh, so you know uh, so we have uh, today among the speakers is dr ashish kumar and dr mark patel who will be joining us in a little while now uh, because dr ashish is speaking first and will be followed by it uh, by mark patel uh, but in the meantime you know let me give you a little brief uh, about about the whole agenda for for the day uh so that you know uh, you you are all aware of what is it that we want to be put across and what is it that we want uh to be put across on to the other side also uh, for for any questions that have to be answered uh so essentially uh, we have uh, we have today's session divided into into two components uh, the morning component is of course for the life members for for the life members and for the for the faculty and also you know from among the faculty who are the who actually are are actively involved uh, in the reviewing process of the manuscript for different journals and i'm sure you know all of you are uh, and then the evening would be essentially addressing the mps students and talking to them about the research so the idea for this for for, for the morning uh, session actually came from discussions that we have been you know holding for quite some time whenever you know some editors would sit around or some 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 faculty would say it and and there would be an issue of uh, you know publications uh, and how the manuscripts are getting reviewed whether it is right whether it is wrong uh, whether the, the review process is transparent whether the review process is non transparent whether whether the uh, people who are doing the review are really knowing what they are doing uh, so all these things have been you know part of uh, part of uh, uh discussions and i'm sure you know you people also have been discussing this uh so you know with ashish who's who's our current editor uh of journal of indian society of paleontology and you know ever since he has taken over uh 3 years back am i right ashish yeah so 3 years back you know our journal journal has seen a different dimension altogether um, not to undermine anybody else's contribution uh but one thing is certainly there that ever since he has taken over uh, we have understood the meaning of the launch date of the journal you know if it if it is a jan feb issue uh, then the launch date for all the issues have been first of jan you know march april issue gets launched on first of march uh, which actually speaks a lot uh, about about the kind of work that that ashish has been putting into into our journal and and, and probably this work Uh, gets reflected on the kind of manuscripts also getting submitted. You know, I will certainly share with you later during the during the talk uh, that we are probably the only journal in the country uh, which is receiving more than a thousand uh, manuscript submission in in a year. You know, which is which goes on to say uh, that, and out of, out of that, I think hardly uh, probably one fifty of them gets published or something like that. Uh, so which which essentially goes on to say that that our manuscript submission rate is to the tune of 1 is to 8 which is a huge huge ratio uh, and that is that is possible only because now we know you know there were days when when we would all crave with each other uh, that we are submitting a manuscript and uh, that journal guy is sitting on it sleeping on it for two years not our journal per se but you know the journals on the whole uh, that they have been sleeping on it for for two years now for one year nothing is being heard and ever since ashish has taken over i have had people you know talking to us also saying ki wo you know what does that editor do we send the manuscript and in 3 days of time we get a reply back whether it is going gone for review or there are any any you know lacunas or it is rejected so what is what is it that he is doing so that essentially again again says that you know our work is being done by ashish for the editor which is which is great and we must be really thankful to him uh but the topic for today essentially is that you know all of us get these reviews uh, manuscripts to review and if you really look at at how the manuscripts are reviewed uh, the editor probably would get three different opinions from three different reviewers so getting different opinions from the different reviewers is, is a great thing 
but but three different tangential responses coming from key reviewers essentially mean that that particular manuscript is being seen in three different angles uh you know if one says accepted accepted without revision and one says accepted accepted with some minor revision and the third person says rejected then that means there is a disconnect and that disconnect is probably what we are going to act so let us all understand at our end also that there are processes involved in reviewing a manuscript in in in, in reviewing a manuscript the way not not saying at all uh, that we do not know how to review all of us learn by our mistakes Uh, but i think today uh, between ashish and mark a uh, lot of these things would be sorted out uh, in terms of uh, you know how the how the journal should how manuscript should be reviewed uh, and i think you know uh, what ashish has as as step b is whenever we get into physical meetings uh, so we probably would have a small congregation of the reviewers and have a physical meeting here also before or after the conference whichever way depending on the funds that we have Uh, that that the, the journal would have. Uh, so without any further ado, I, Dr. Nithya Pandey, uh, actually is in, our president. Uh, she is in Shiri Nagar, so she is trying really hard to join from there. But there are a lot of network issues. So I don't think so that she is still here. In fact, we were waiting for her to join and before we start. So I think we should go ahead and as and when she would join us, you know, we will acknowledge her presence amongst us. Uh, so without any further ado, I would. Uh, introduce uh, the speaker for the day uh, the first speaker for the day who is dr ashish kumar uh, all of us know him very well all of us know his work uh, but just for the record uh, he is a bds mbs from bapuji alumni presently working as professor uh, he has in his cv he has written just three lines and i will read that uh, that he is alumni of bapuji uh, dental college hospital to davangiri currently working as professor and head department of perio regional institute of medical sciences in pal manipur and he is the editor of journal of india society of pathology all of us knew it so you know you don't have to really write that but but besides that uh, we all know that he is a, a thorough thorough gentleman a very hard working boy uh, and who has done real wonders uh, for the journal so over to you ashish thank you sir thank you so much for a wonderful introduction and uh, let me share my screen or my screen is visible sir okay thank you so much sir for the wonderful introduction i start my presentation with the, the grace of god the blessings of my mother and my teachers at bapuji dental college and hospital davangere i must thank isp president ma'am secretary sir especially ashish sir for having given me a chance to speak on this platform and it is a huge huge honor to be speaking on the same platform with legend dr professor mark bartold it is a really really something which anyone would dream of and this is a huge huge honor for me i am presently working as in dental college regional institute of medical sciences in pal manipur and this is manipur not manipal this is the northeast of india and these are my dear colleagues in the department now first question is when we talk about reviewing why do we need to review now the main aim of reviewing is to assess the quality the validity and relevance and often originality of the manuscript i say often because not that every manuscript will be original a lot of work would have been done on this previously also so originality may not be the prime question here but quality validity and relevance of that manuscript is important now ultimate aim of reviewing is that you maintain the integrity in scientific research and you have to finally filter out the poor quality articles which come to you as ashish has said we almost have 1000 manuscripts which come to journal of indian society of odontology and we have six issues or almost 15 um, articles in each issue 90 articles get published and we have only acceptance rate of around 12 to 14% so you can very well imagine that out of 1000 manuscripts if acceptance rate is 12% only 120 130 manuscripts get accepted so that is what 
is basically the aim of reviewing that you get out or take out all the poor quality articles and maintain the scientific integrity in the research. Now you have to also understand that it is there is a publisher's perspective also. When you have quality articles published in the article in the, in the journal, the journal's quality gets raised, and it is a brand building for them. Ultimately, once a brand is built up for a journal, you will have more and more people wanting to get their articles published in that that journal, and it becomes much more difficult with you know quality being raised higher and higher with good peer review process. You will have more and more people wanting to publish it in that. So it is a brand building exercise also from a publisher's point of view. Now you want your journal. Now for us, the publisher is you know the society. Now you want the level of journal to go up. You will have to have good peer review process. Then only the value of this journal goes goes up with time. Now it has been seen from Willie's. You know one of the Willie's uh, research or uh, review process. They have seen that. 84% of people would say that you know peer review is the you know is central to having good good kind of good papers in your journal and nine out of ten researchers feel that peer review improves their quality. Now it has been improves the quality of research which is submitted. That means peer review improves and motivates the authors to submit good articles and those articles in turn when are peer reviewed become much more better. With the peer review process, so it is something which is helping each other. A good peer review gives you better, you know, uh, would try to improve upon your article by giving good suggestions, and ultimately the thing which gets published and accepted is much better than what would have been submitted. So it is a mutual thing which improves the kind of the research, improves the writing of the authors, and improves the articles which are published in the journal. So what are what are the different what are the different kinds of peer reviews? Now we have different kinds of peer reviews, which we know. Well, first, the double blind peer review, where the author does not know the reviewer and the reviewer does not know who the who the author is, and they are blind to each other in the review, which we follow in our journal. Then you have a single blind kind of a review where the authors don't know who the reviewers are, but reviewers definitely know who the authors are. Then there is an open peer review process is also followed by certain journals where the authors know who the reviewers are. And reviewers also know who the authors are. Then you have a collaborative review, wherein some journals allow that the, all the reviewers work together and give a report. And sometimes it is also allowed that they include the author in this collaboration and discuss with the author and all the reviewers together discuss to make that make that um, uh, manuscript better. Similarly, you have third-party peer review process wherein you have independent reviewers available where you can submit the manuscript before you submit to a journal, get it peer reviewed, and improve it upon the basis of the comments you get from a third-party review. Then you have a cascading peer review wherein you will have a you know article submitted to a, for example, a journal. They say they cannot publish it, but they will suggest a new journal and submit your you know, com comments to that uh, the new new journal, and mostly that new journal is from their publication house only. That is called as a cascading peer review. And some journals might have a post-publication review, wherein the comments which come after it has been published are also seen. So those post-publication, those are called as post-publication peer review. So th these are different types of you know peer reviews. Now, how to perform a peer review? First is that again, this is from Willie. You have to be critical but constructive. Now, critical means that you have to be your comments have to be critical but beneficial to the author to improve his manuscript. Now, you have to be con you know considered. Don't think that just because author does not know you, you can say anything to the author, or you can write anything which is offending to the author. Now, you have to as as has been mentioned that it, the writing part should be such that. When you meet that author, you should be able to face him and you should not be offending to him. Secondly, always try to meet the deadlines. Now, what when you once you accept that you have to review an article, there are deadlines, three weeks, four weeks, every journal gives you a deadline. Always try to meet those the most deadlines and submit your comments to that. Maintain a nominee team. Although it is a we follow a double brand process, but sometimes through some processes, you can guess whose work it is, or sometimes indirectly some you know, part in material method, sometimes some mentions that this study was done in this particular lab, and you can very well guess with your intelligence that you, you know that person, or 
sometimes people tell their friends that i have submitted this so but still despite that you might come to know through some way or the other that whose manuscript it it is it is very important to maintain anonymity because according to reproof it is a double blind process and you are not supposed to or you should not be tempted to tell the person that your manuscript is with me for review and always always avoid boy bias if you have any anything which is against the author against the manuscript against the topic you should never accept for uh, for the uh, for reviewing for that particular manuscript now on being requested when you get a when you get a email requesting you to review here three things which you, you should actually understand and see before accepting to review is there a potential conflict of interest now conflict of interest means is there someone close to you or someone who is a member of your faculty who has submitted it if you have any papers co-authored with that or if you if you actually come to know of the author or if you have any involvement with that kind of project which has come to you for review if you are working on a similar project so anything where you have a potential conflict of interest you should not accept it secondly if you are not if you do not have enough expertise on that particular topic you should have courtesy to decline saying that you do not have you know the kind of uh, expertise to review this manuscript and thirdly if you do not have time lines to accept and submit your reviews within those time lines you should decide whether you would be able to submit your comments by that timeline so these three things which should come in mind before accepting your request for a review now once you have accepted the review minimum two to three readings are required to really really come to a judgment what is the quality of that uh, particular uh, manuscript now the first reading you should always look at what is the main question which is being addressed by the reader the main question generally is at the end of the introduction when he says this was the gap in the research and this is what he is trying to find or fill up the gap by doing what whatever methods they whatever uh, method he would have employed he would address that question in the end of the introduction so you might have to see originality but you also have to see if the topic is not original also the topic has been dealt with what addition does he is he going to do to the literature with his research as i said every topic is not original research is research there are many times where you have to validate a research by doing it again by doing it on different paper so there is something which would get added to literature so may not be original topic but with that repetition or you know replicating that study what addition is being done to that literature and literature is to be seen in first reading you also have to see the data which is being presented the reasoning which is being given in discussion and then conclusion are they consistent with the main question asked the main question is on you know regeneration and the answer the data is not talking about that then you know those are things which you have to see whether everything is in sync with each other or not now normally most of the studies you would find that results are in in you know sync with the most of the research which has been done very few studies you would find the evidence to be not in sync with the normal uh, study so if you find a study where current evidence is not similar then you have to much more seriously see and you know with a microscope what justification have they given for justifying the result which is not in sync with the current evidence and have they have they given a credible credible uh, reasoning for that answers for those uh, results so those things have to be seen in first writing and important is quality of writing how have the how has the article been written the language part also has to be looked at in first consideration so there are some time saving tactics which you can use while reviewing during first reading now look at major potential flaws which you can look at suppose if you have if you have a experimental study now before going into second third reading going into details and then rejecting look at the experimental methodology is it sound or not if it is not sound it is a major flaw you can definitely think that this cannot go ahead and it has to be rejected if there are contradicting dictions as i said there has to be they have to be in sync with the data has to be in sync the reasoning and the conclusion has to be in sync with the question so if if your conclusion is not in sync with the statistics the data and the question posed again it is a major flaw you may not go ahead with second third reading and you can start making up mind that there is some major thing major problem with this manuscript which 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 will prevent us going further and you know for a second reading and cannot be accepted and if, if someone or the author have ignored 
the factors which can have influence on the study. So those factors have to be looked at and then decide. Now suppose if you think that methodology is okay, then look at data because after all, it is all about information which you are going to collect. You look for flaws in the information which is being provided. Look if there's a data is sufficient or not. If the tables are clear or not. Now this is all first tried, as I said, time-saving tactics. Unclear data tables or not. If the tables are clear or not. If if the data is contradicting and and the confirmatory data is without strong arguments for such repetition. As I said, research is repetition, but for a data to be, you know, study to be done again and data to be confirmed, there has to be a strong argument for such repetition. If you do not find that, obviously, now you have made up of mind that you want to reject it. But before that, the, another thing is the English language. The first thing which you should come to mind is if it is difficult to understand, you can definitely reject it after first reading. But if you can understand the core message, but the language is poor, do not reject it. Because if you are able to understand, you can definitely suggest improvement in English and suggest, suggest to the author that you can take a help of some English uh, writing services or you can take a help of someone who is more proficient in speaking English and writing English and improve and resubmit it and revise it and resubmit it. Secondly, regarding English language, you have to understand that you may be Tharoor, you know, you may have language of the level of Shashi Tharoor to be right. But you cannot force your writing style on the author's paper. It is author's paper. You have to accept it the way he has written. You cannot change the writing style. And you have to be sensitive to people. You have, you know, when manuscripts come from non English speaking authors. Now, why I'm speaking here, this is because you have to understand that our journal for record has submissions for almost 90 countries. Okay. And most of those, and many of those countries are Middle East countries, Brazil, you know, Uruguay and all those countries which are not natively English speaking countries. So you would many times find a lot of mistakes in there, but you have to be sensitive to those people who are non-English speaking and you have to write a feedback with due respect, telling them what exactly is the improvement. Just because English is not up to your level, you cannot, you cannot just reject it. If it is not, if, if, if you can understand the manuscript, then you are not supposed to judge the grammar or the spellings. You are you are the spellings of that manuscript. You should judge the research. But if any errors in writing are changing the meaning or clarity of understanding the research or clarity of understanding the arguments which we have they have given in their discussion, you can highlight those things. But be sensitive while writing about English language, especially for people who are non non English speaking speaking people. Now, if you find if you have decided after you know all this first reading that you have to reject this then also always read the manuscript completely because the full reading will make sure that what initial concerns you had during initial writing and using those time saving tactics are indeed correct that you have made up that there is some problem with methodology you will be sure after reading once completely manuscript that what initial uh, you know thought process or points you have made are correct by reading the complete secondly while rejecting if there are any positive aspects in that manuscript, you can mention it to the authors, which would help him in submission and improve, you know, in further submission and also help him in improving that particular manuscript or in future research. And he would take care of the things which he has gone wrong in this. Everyone would go wrong. We have had rejections. Everyone has rejections. And then you tend to improve on it by reading those comments, which come from, you know, experienced people. And then you start, you know, once you start implementing those points, you, your acceptance rate increases. So those points, what you give to those authors are very, very important, even while rejecting. Now, after first reading, if you think that you have to go ahead and it can be, you know, further go for a second reading. Now, in second reading, you have to see for the content of the paper in each section. You have to check again, see whether there is a clarity of language or not, and you have to see for the reasoning and justification. What reasoning and justification they have done, given for the results which they which which uh, they have achieved, and also you have to look for if there are in the reasoning and justification where they are trying to justify their results, they justify this research. There are any factual errors, whether 
the justifications which have been given are clear or not or writing is clear and people can understand the justifications and if there are any invalid arguments or not so these are the things which you have to look at because ultimately discussion is the part which is important which everyone is the most important part of any article where they try to justify the results they want and they compare the results with the people who have already done their research so that is important now let us understand what you have to look at in each section the introduction is you have to see that whether they are mentioned why are they doing this research and how are they how is that research important to be done what is the gap in the research they are trying to fill up with that their particular study now material methods you have to understand that it should give answer to how that study has been done now any research has to be repeatable replicatable and robust and reproducible now these are four different words when you will go into you know finding the meaning every this 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 is the basics of any research and you will find these words to be used by different areas differently now for us repeatable means if the same experiment can be while reading can you if you the same researcher can do the same experiment again and can get the same results that means he the results which are which you, which he has got sorry got are reliable and he is able to defend it whether the method which i explained can be replicatable replicatable means someone else tries to use those same experiment same lab method and different researcher does it and can you get the same results that means the results can be validated by someone else so the research in material methods should be can be validated by someone else and the data which has been given should be enough that it is considered to be reliable and fourth thing is reproducible whether if the same experiment is done by some other method and can we get the same results so you have to see that enough material has been given in material and method for someone else to read it understand it and replicate and repeat the experiment if he wants to the information provided how that was done what was used what materials was used what parameters were explained have to be explained if it is a new method the author has to explain it if it is a older method which has been used there has to be a reference to the original author who had done that study and need, the person need not explain that method he can just say that this was originally done by this and being copying the same method but the information has to be there how that study has been done so that the reader should be able to repeat it replicate it and get a robust data and maybe someone wants to reproduce this study should be able to do it so that are the characteristics which you should look at while reviewing material and methods then research and discussion you to understand that results is a coherent story you have to know what happened what was discovered what was confirmed what was not confirmed all that has to be put up into a results uh, section and discussion is basically you have to look for whether the question which was raised in the introduction has been answered in discussion or not so discussion is always starts from answering that question what was at the last paragraph of introduction you answer that and then you start justifying that who all have that done that study when was that the study done what were their results what was you know what was said by them or reasoning given there by them and what is the reasoning you are giving for those results so you answer who did it what was done by others when was it done how was it done and why was it done and same are applied and compared with your studies so you have to not only justify you have to understand that discussion is context context means background to that study and reasoning which which applies to here has to be applied to your research and explained every result gets explained in discussion that has to be seen now coming to references one of the most important parts but people did tend to not look at it you have to see that there are three aspects of uh, you know when you review you have to three aspects which you have to look at first is accuracy whether the cited articles are central to author's argument or not the format used is correct or not i give you a simple example we use vancouver system now you go to jcp they use harvard system harvard system is author name and a year in bracket now that is absolutely ultra of or you know opposite of what we use now i have seen people tending to copy it from a jcp and put it into our manuscript and you know don't change and people don't change it so we have to look at whether some, some something like this has been done or not second thing which we have to see is whether the references are adequate or not are the arguments supported or not do we, do they have adequately put up references which are similar and dissimilar to discuss the trends of their results in the discussion or not adequate adequacy is the second important thing for any references the third important thing is balance 
Now you have to balance out those which you, you know the references should be in such a way that balanced out that you have to put references for authors who have done the similar study. Don't try to you know remove negative re references just because your study does not you know uh, does not have that aspect. You don't quote those authors. You have to quote authors who may not have results similar to you. Don't try to quote. your own self citations to justify your studies and you have to as i said earlier due recognition to people who have done done those studies earlier initial discoveries and related work which has been done so you have to acknowledge those people if someone has done it earlier acknowledge that that acknowledgement should always be there in the list of references so to revise just to repeat it accuracy adequacy and balance is the three things which you have to look at references and these are important because most of the journals have A limited set of references which they allow to be used. Where most, like someone will say, thirty, forty, fifty. So within that, these three things have to be seen. Now, coming to preparation of a report. Now, when you prepare prepare a report, you have to follow the journal guideline. Many journals will have a standard format of writing a report. Many have a, a non-standardized format of writing. So you have to know that. Now, in both the formats, you have to understand that you have to be constructive. You have to be very objective. and you have to help the author by giving comments in the such a way that whether you are rejecting or accepting it he should be able to improve his research further and you should be very specific in answering that and be professional and refrain from making any professional comments any pro sorry personal comments in that report then your feedback has to be fair honest and unbiased whether you are you know it should give a fair view to the author what exactly is his uh, the standard of his manuscript then as i have said earlier don't try to change the language of the uh, manuscript you can point out if there is a major mistake where understanding of that particular topic re or reasoning is affecting you can definitely point out that the fourth thing which you have to understand is it is not your domain to suggest future work your domain is to just review the article which has been given to you you should you should you should concentrate on the quality of that article the validity of those results and the rigor and and you know the rigor of the work to what is to be further done is not your uh, job to suggest in that okay and you may point out if there is something missing for example you find this particular analysis would be more important and would make the study better those suggestions or to use a particular test to improve the manuscript are always always welcome but further what can be done is not your this thing uh, not uh, in the job to be of a reviewer and last thing is accountability you are accountable for your work don't tell someone else to review your articles and then give a report and don't make unfair negative comments which are which which you cannot justify so you have these are the things which you have to look at while preparing a report as i said structuring a report can be formal or informal formal uh, method is when uh, journal has certain questions which have to be answered and your review your review report will be based on those answers which they ask that is a formal type and if you have a informal way you can say summary you can you know while writing a report write major issues and then write minor issues and every journal will ask for comments which go to author and confidential comments which go to editors only now as you look for language of a author of, of a author you have to also look at the language which you write while writing a report always treat the author's work that the way you would like your work to be treated obviously you are not reviewer every time you are author also if the comments which come to you for your research are important and you have to understand that those comments were if they are offending to you you will feel bad similarly if you write some offending comments to some author it will be bad so you have to treat the work the way you do it your review should be constructive and critical that in which you should help the author in improving their article be polite honest and clear and objective while writing and write clearly for everyone to understand especially the english should not be too complicated especially for non english speaking people to understand your comments so your writing presentation also matters in that regard and your recommendation as you know could be acceptable minor revision major revision and reject now when you reject always give a constructive feedback for author to improve the research but he should also come to know reasons why that has been rejected 
and explain those reasons to editor also why manuscript should not be published you just can't write there is nothing new it is rejected if there is a reason you need to mention that and that reason should go to author now many times reviewers there is nothing in it reviewer well, on what basis would a editor reject this and say to the author i after all it was given to a reviewer to review it asking for comments for reasons to reject it those reasons have to be given to author so that he can read it improve upon it in the next time so you have to write that now another thing which you have to be careful is many times you know in the comments to authors there are positive comments encouraging comments which are critical but in the comments to the editor it is written please don't accept it so you cannot have two different comments critical and negative comments confidential comments sent to the editor and while being positive and encouraging to the author so this would be a very bad situation because author will not understand with those positive and encouraging comments what was wrong in his manuscript he will not be able to improve it he will not understand why he has rejected it why the manuscript has been rejected and it becomes very difficult for editor and the journal to justify why it has been rejected so if the manuscript is bad and you want it if you are critically writing and in confidential comments writing to the author uh, to the editor that it has to be rejected your comments may not be too positive and encouraging critically comment constructive comments which should explain in those comments why it has been rejected and positively mention that what can be done to make further research or improve his further research now coming to the last part of it another two slides now tips for reviewing that i would you know which we should keep in mind that first of all respond promptly promptly to invitations i have seen many times people don't respond it they kept they kept and i we have to send messages please look into those manuscripts please look into those manuscripts so if you cannot do it please please deny accepting or ex don't accept reviewing and once you have accepted please give enough time stay within the scope of that article focus on the research not on too much of an english language or the personal thing show integrity you may come to know it is a friend's manuscript but if it is not good enough it is not good enough it has to be rejected whether it is whose ever manuscript it is be constructive consistent now why i am writing consistently i have seen people asking for a major review in first revision and when those revisions have been done the second comment says rejected now if those major comments have not been answered you have the right to uh, reject it but you cannot reject it on any other basis now saying that this is nothing new in it in the second you know revision you have to be consistent in your comments look at conclusion see whether conclusion match the question asked the data and all those things check for robustness or a fact and if a manuscript is very good don't shy in giving credit write to the author your manuscript is absolutely wonderfully written there is nothing wrong in giving credit that would be a morale booster for the author and finally what you are not supposed to do don't check for formatting because that back end will do spelling punctuation grammar you know would be checked copy copy editing would be done by the journals as i said if language is too bad and you cannot understand that should be the only basis for rejection of art of an article if you can understand but language is bad you can Uh, tell him to improve it but just for spelling punctuation grammar you need not comment it you should not comment for plagiarism because for our journal if manuscript is going for reviewing it has gone through plagiarism check and it is okay with that you know, you cannot write back and saying that check for plagiarism it has already been done so don't see for ethical standard because those are asked for by submission you do not rerun the research and see whether that has been done and and you are not supposed to make the final decision because there will be other reviewers also who would send their comments and then jointly it has to be decided what decision has to be taken thank you so much for your valuable time well thank you so much ashish uh, yes mark we are able to see you now uh, praveen can you give the hosting rights to a1005717 boom sir come back again sir uh, a1005717 he needs to be given okay, the okay. host okay 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 am i audible uh, yes, yes ma'am you are audible yeah 
so ashi thank you uh, thank you so much for for such a wonderful presentation and you know just for information of everybody mark bato has also joined us uh, but i think before uh, we move on to that part of presentation uh, today you know there are a few questions which have been uh, asked and if uh, there is uh, anything else that anybody else wants to ask please raise your hand or you know type your message uh, into into the window uh, we'll we'll take take it up from there Uh, so you uh, one question that has been asked is that uh, you have mentioned about the third party review uh, now forward looking can we uh, at the uh, at journal of isp look at this mechanism of having uh, an identified third party reviewer so that you know if i have to get my manuscript reviewed i may come via that mechanism uh, to you and you know shorten the process of reviewing at your end so that is not uh, for the shortening of as i as i understand it is not for the shortening of the process of review at the journal then it is for the authors to get a frank view of their manuscript by getting it reviewed by you know getting a third party review and then improve upon it and before submitting it to a journal so that the rejection rate gets reduced the journal will definitely get it reviewed but then the common points which the mistakes they made would be improved upon if you know they get it reviewed before by someone and then submit to the journal okay okay so the what essentially you are trying to say is that uh, even this third party review is not going to be a technical review per se it could more be a uh, you know a, a sort of a language review or you know, writing review and things like that yes yes so like for example uh, we have lot of manuscripts which get uh, rejected because of high amount of plagiarism now you have software available where people check in by getting it by you know paying it and using it and mm -hmm. then submit it after you know uh, if they have high plagiarism they reduce it modify it and then submit it so that rejection at our end because of plagiarism gets reduced is something similar to that okay good uh, then uh, another question that has been asked is uh, that uh, you know reviewers and a lot of us who are who are part of the uh, you know audience today are the reviewers uh do you think a paid review a paid review probably is not the right word but a remunerative review is something that the journal should look into not in terms of you know influencing anybody's opinion but essentially in terms of remunerating the time that a reviewer is uh, is putting in we all understand though it is more of a uh, voluntary activity but still you know is there anything like that as of now in our journal is not there but i feel if that process is there i think the time boundations and a kind of review which would come in would improve because people would be people tend to give it in time otherwise there no next time reviews won't come and the renovation also would go that factor is also there because nowadays i have seen we i have to literally message many many times to many many reviewers to submit their comments and they don't come in and those are the issues which we any editor would face so mm -hmm. and even you know initial re requesting email i have not responded to we, we don't know whether he will be taking up or those or not and we have to literally wait for it many issues could be resolved but then you know there are other negative parts also to it then there will be everyone would be because of renumeration aspects many people would want to get review although they may not be right people for you know reviewing so those aspects mm -hmm. if those can be curtailed and looked into then maybe this could be a good option okay excellent Right. Uh, and and you, I think if, uh, one of the uh, real take home message for all of us out of your presentation is you know even if a manuscript has to be rejected, you know rejected with a positive reinforcement that would certainly we get rejected you know all the time. Uh, but you know internationally we have seen that all those rejections actually come with some kind of positive reinforcement also. So you don't really feel you feel bad, uh, but but then you also are asked to improve and you know why exactly you have been rejected. So, you know that really helps. Uh, so, so thank the, you very much ask yeah. yeah the only way you can avoid rejection is not submitted yeah <laughs> right <laughs> so so thank you very much ashish a wonderful ashish. presentation uh, uh we, we really thank you uh, from, from all of us here and now we have dr nimphia also with us president of indian society of paleontology hope your connection okay. issues are sorted out we know you are in in sirinagar a good place okay. but a but a bad connection too uh, but i think now you are doing okay uh so we yeah i i time. hope i am am i audible right now yes you are audible and visible both uh, and uh, we have mark also okay. with us so i will hand over uh, the stage yeah, okay. uh, on us further on hello yeah yeah please, please.
Please go uh, ahead, ma'am. Good afternoon, Dr. Mark, Dr. Mark Bartol, and uh, very good morning to all the faculty members and the delegates. I, on the behalf of ISP, would like to uh, uh, welcome you all on this unique webinar that we are already over with one session, which was very well uh, handled by Dr. Ashish Kumar. And um, I feel that as uh, Dr. Ashish Jan said that uh, reviewing is a very important part of uh, making the journals very uh, high standard and to improve, go on improving the standard of the journals. And um, it's my proud privilege to introduce Dr. Mark Bartold. He doesn't need any introduction as such. He's so well known in the uh, field of periodontics. And I was just going through some of his um, citations yesterday and I was amazed to see that the uh, research he has done on the stem cells, it has more than, only one article has more than 3,300 citations in one article. I uh, don't know how many citations he has. He has done a wonderful work on the stem cells and also on the systemic, uh, this link. And um, as it's customary to anyway introduce the speaker, I would uh, like to say a few things about him. Uh, he's a professor emeritus at the University of Adelaide and prof uh, formerly professor of periodontics and the director of Colgate Clinical Dental Research Center, University of Adelaide uh, from 2002 to 2017. And prior to this, professor of periodontology at the University of Queensland 19, from 1992 to 2002. He also has honorary professional appointments at the University of Queensland, Australia, and University of Bern, Switzerland. He's the past president of the International Academy of Periodontology, the Asian Pacific Society of Periodontology, and Division of Periodontics at the, of the Royal Australian College of Dental Surgeons. He's an editorial board member of 10 international journals, who better would be able to know about the review process an associate editor of the Journal of Periodontal Research, P2000, and clinical and experimental dental research, and editor of the Australian Dental Journal, and editor emeritus of the Journal of International Academy of Periodontology. He has received numerous awards for his contribution to the periodontology, including the Strawman IADR Award for Periodontal Regenerative Medicine, the IADR Distinguished Scientific Award for the Research in the Periodontal Disease, he has been awarded honorary life membership of the AAP and Indian Society of Periodontology. Uh, and as I said, his research interests are the use of periodontal stem cells for the periodontal regeneration and systemic health intervention. He has authored more than 320 scientific articles. And in addition to his ongoing research and lecturing interests, he works half-time in private specialist periodontal practice in LA. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I uh, welcome Dr. Mark Bartol for his presentation right now. Okay, thank, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Nymphia, for that lovely um, introduction. And it's a great honour and privilege to be able to participate in this meeting. And, and thank you, Ashish, for, uh, for the, the invitation. I, I came in um, 15 minutes early and was able to listen to some of uh, Ashish's um, presentation, and it, it seems to me that I may well repeat a lot of, of what was already said in the previous presentation, but sometimes I think repetition is a good thing because I think you, people are going to see um, what, what we do agree on as being some um, important um, factors in, in the discussion that we're trying to have today. Now, I'm just going to switch over to my screen, if I can. Okay, and we're just... yeah. So can you see my screen now? Yeah. yeah yep. Okay. So what I, what I was going to try to go through today was the process of scientific writing and also manuscript reviewing, which I think has already been covered a lot in the previous presentation, but hopefully um, some, new, some new aspects from this will, will come up as, as well. Okay, now. So um, in terms of scientific writing, I, I think it's important to remember when embarking on a, on a process of scientific research that really the goal of that research process is in fact to publish the results of, of that work. And I think a good way to understand this is to think that a scientific experiment 
no matter how spectacular the results might be, is not considered, in my opinion, to be completed until the results have been published. So once we embark on this process, we owe it to ourselves and our colleagues and the community to ensure that our work does, um, does get published. The, the cornerstone, in fact, of the philosophy of science is based on a very fundamental assumption, and that is that original research must be published. If, if we don't do that, well, then obviously the field that we're working in can't move forward. And so um, new scientific knowledge needs to be authenticated and then added to the existing database that as a, as a whole, we, we call and recognize as science. So, in terms of what constitutes a scientific paper, well, clearly uh, it's obvious that it's a written and it's a published report, which it is describing original. And the, the emphasis here is on original research results. Um, a lot of research sometimes is repetitive and only confirmatory, but ideally we would be aiming to try to describe original research results that add to the body of evidence in the field that we're working. The, the actual culture of scientific writing is, has been defined over and defined and refined over a very long time. In fact, maybe three centuries or more of developing tradition, editorial practice, scientific ethics, and the interplay of printing and publishing procedures. And it's interesting, I think, to, to note that even though scientific writing has been with us for some three centuries, it's still going through um, very radical changes, especially um, in, the, in these current times. And the, the process of, of publishing is certainly undergoing rapid change as, as some, uh, and nearly all journals now are considering moving to the so-called concept of, of open access publishing um, and other, other aspects in the publishing process are, are continuing to evolve. So it's not a static process, but it's definitely a growing and evolving um, area. So when we come time, we've finished all of our experiments, and we've gathered all the data, we've analysed it, and we understand what we've got, we begin the process of the organisation of the scientific paper. So really, it's, it's, its process is fairly simple. We need to decide, well, what is the story that we're telling? And that will form the title of the paper. What was the problem that was to be studied will become the introduction of the paper. How did we study the problem will be the materials and methods. What did we find will be the results and what do the findings mean will form the discussion. And so a traditional scientific paper will have these components to it. And I think we need to have a look now and just see how, how we begin to compose each of these sections of a scientific paper. Now, remember that the title is probably one of the most critical parts of the whole, of the whole paper. And it, it's important to understand that thousands, hundreds, thousands of people will read the title. But after that, very few, if any, would then go on to actually read the, the paper in its entirety. So we need to have a good title. And that would be one in which the fewest possible words will adequately describe the contents of the paper or the nature of the study. Remember that the title is a label and it does not need to be a sentence as we, as we understand a sentence construction. I, I strongly urge people to avoid any jargon or abbreviations in the title because remember that many people will read the, the title of the paper, may not be familiar with the field, and so jargon and abbreviations will be very difficult for people to understand the purpose of the paper. Also, um, I do recommend strongly to avoid trendy or clever titles. Just keep the title to the basics and simply describe what these what the story is for, um, for the um, for the paper that you're preparing after the title of the paper comes the authors and this is this is a critical part of the preparation of the manuscript and without any doubt the inclusion of authors and the order of the authors on the paper is one of the most common sources of conflict within the scientific community it is very important that you get you get this right, and it's very important that you clarify this um, right at the start, um, perhaps even during the process of doing the study, 
initial discussions about the manuscript, everyone needs to be very clear who will and will not be um, on the paper. So in terms of that, who should be an author? Well, I, these are some general guidelines that I use. First of all, um, someone needs to have generated the idea for the study. Um, the writing of the study protocol will involve a, a one or a number of people who obtained the funds to do the study, who actually did the work, um, who supervised the work, and then the writing of the, pa of the paper. Now, of these six, um, six points, oh, sorry, seven points, and then of course the paper needs to be coordinated with the submission process. I think it would be reasonable to say that at least four of those criteria need to be met by an individual to warrant them being an author. If they don't fulfill those in these criteria, then their contribution to the work has been less than substantial and probably they should not be included as an author. Once we've agreed on the authors, then the order of the names becomes important. So the first or the senior author will usually be the person who did the bulk of the work that's being reported. Then the second and subsequent authors will have a more minor contributions to the project, but still significant contributors in terms of the list of uh, um, criteria that I've presented in the previous slide. And then the last author is traditionally the head of the laboratory or department where the work was done. And this is very important in my opinion, provided they also fulfill the criteria listed in, a pre in, the, in the previous slide. Very often over the years, um, I have been asked to be an author on a paper. Um, I've used those criteria as to whether or not I feel I should be. And certainly as a head of a very big department, I've never insisted, and I don't think anybody should insist that their name go on a paper on all papers that come out of their department. That should only happen if they have significantly and, and realistically contributed to, to the paper in question. The next um, aspect is the abstract. So this is also a very important part of the paper because a well-prepared abstract is going to enable readers to identify some of the basic content, the, co the concepts of the study and the document. They can quickly go through it and then determine how relevant the paper is likely to be to their interests and then decide whether they need to read the entire document or, or forget about it. Generally speaking, I think it would be good to aim for an abstract that is concise. So aim for somewhere around about 250 words. Some journals have very strict um, restrictions on how many words an abstract should be. It should clearly define what is in the paper. And then um, it depends on the journal whether it the, um, the abstract will be a so-called structured or a traditional or conventional abstract. So this is an example of a conventional abstract where it's just free flowing text. The, it still sort of flows from, if you like, a, an, an introduction or a background through the materials and methods, results and, um, and conclusion or a structured abstract where each of the, the background methods, results and conclusion are clearly delineated. Now, once that is all done, then the next set section is the introduction. And this is the first section of the text proper. So the purpose of the introduction will be to give sufficient background information to allow the reader to understand and evaluate the rationale for the study, the hypothesis being tested and the aims of the study. Now, again, I, I um, am very much in, uh, in favour of a hypothesis and aims being clearly stated in the introduction. I do believe in hypothesis driven research and for, from that point of view, therefore, nearly all studies should have a hypothesis that is being tested and then, of course, clearly delineate the aims of the study in the introduction. Uh, you will obviously cover the nature and the scope of the study and then review very succinctly just the pertinent literature to provide the rationale for the study. So within the introduction, you must provide a clear rationale as to why you think doing this study is important. And then state the method of the, of the investigation. You don't really need to go into any, de any detail, just say, for example, it was a case control study or an in vitro study or whatever kind of study that, that you may, may have, have undertaken. And then, as I said, state clearly the hypothesis and aims. 
in the materials and methods section, you need to um, provide enough detail so that someone else who works in the field can repeat the experiments. So that means that um, important detail um, must must be provided in the methods so that somebody can replicate the work if they if they so desire. Um, the materials you need to include the supplier's name and address. So again, if somebody wants to repeat the work and they're not quite sure where to get something from, that information is in the methods, materials and methods. Present how you did the study in the methods in the chronological order in which they were done so that the paper then flows in a, in a sensible uh, manner. And of course, refer to the author instructions for details on how to describe measurements, concentrations, time, et cetera, et cetera, because uh, journals, all journals will differ a little bit on how they, um, they refer to, the, to this information. And of course, it needs to be appropriately referenced if you're using the methodology of other people or even your own, if you've developed a method. And of course, do, do not put any results or discussion in this, in this section. It, it's purely a factual uh, delivery of information that tells people how you, how you did the study. Once we've done that, well, then we can come to the results section. And there are two main ingredients to the results section. First of all, you need to give an overall description of the experiments, providing a big picture, but without repeating the experimental detail is provided in the materials and methods. It's a common mistake that um, um, inexperienced authors make that they repeat a lot of the materials and methods in the results. And that's clearly not necessary and becomes quite redundant in many, in many ways. And present the data obtained from the experiments um, at the, as, as you carry the, out, them out. Now, when I, this dot point here, where I say show only representative data, that really refers often more so to the, um, the delivery or the, or the uh, reporting on, um, for example, um, uh, any gel electrophoresis perhaps, or histology or PCR results or whatever, just show representative da data that is indicative of, of the results that, that you got. And then of course you can elaborate further if need be with a, a, ta with a table that, that will de go into much more detail um, in terms of the data that were actually um, generated. You need to try to describe the data as clearly as you can and try to back that up with a figure and a table. Um, it can be irritating sometimes when results are presented and then um, it, in brackets, it's got um, data not shown. Um, I think that's always a cause for concern unless it's very minor data uh, that sort of help, help um, illustrate a point but aren't central to the uh, overall, um, overall study and, and manuscript. Try to avoid any redundancy in the results. So just try to make sure that you don't repeat um, yourself over and over again. For example, when it, the text might read, it is clearly shown in table one that occlusal overload is a common cause of implant failure. You can see that really that it, there, are, there is a lot of redundancy in that statement. It's very verbose. A more succinct way of, of saying that would be occlusal overload is a common cause of implant failure table one. So it's a matter of getting the message through as simply and as clearly uh, as you can and try not to make the sentence constructions overly, overly complicated, long or verbose. With regards to the discussion, um, remember, it's worth remembering that many papers are rejected solely on the basis of an in inadequate discussion, even though the data of the paper can be both valid and, and interesting. And this, by this, I mean, the, if the discussion um, overinterprets the data, um, certainly that is a, is, is a, big, is a big problem. Um, editors and reviewers certainly will, will, um, will look at that. Um, also, try not to make the discussion too long. Another mistake many people make is they have um, perhaps not a lot of results, and then the discussion goes on for six or seven pages. Well, clearly, they're really, again, over-interpreting, over-emphasizing the, the real results and meaning of the paper. So try to, try to keep it um, valid, interesting, and succinct, so that many discussions are often too long and verbose. Again, in the discussion, 
you do not need to recapitulate the results. So don't start repeating everything that you've already presented in the results um, section. It is important to try to compare and contrast your work with the existing um, literature. So point out any exceptions or lack of correlation and define any unsettled points between your data that you've presented and what may already be in the literature. You need to also show how your results and interprets, interpretations either agree or contrast with previous published work and compare with the current rel relevant literature. Many times we see discussions where it, um, either there is not a lot of reference to the literature or there's reference to very old literature. A, a good discussion will present and discuss the results in light of current literature and by current literature i would i would suggest perhaps in the last 10 years um, we're starting to go older than that the question has to be asked well how how relevant is this is this work is it really work that's that's been done a long long time ago and the field has moved on so try to make sure that you that you bring your results and discussion in light with the current um with the current li literature and then finally Try, if you can, um, try to um, present what the theoretical implications of your work might be, the practical applications, the clinical applications are all good. But again, try not to over-interpret how important the results are. Um, you know, if, they're if it's really not particularly well connected, well, then you may not, you may choose not to include um, this sort of um, discussion uh, in, in this part of the um, of the paper, and then finally, um, a final paragraph which would summarise the conclusions as clearly as possible. So, in conclusion, this study has shown that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The acknowledgements is an, also an important part of the paper. So, acknowledge any significant help that you received with regards to contribution to the work or interpretation of the work. So, this would be acknowledging people who don't um, really are not eligible in your opinion to be authors but they have made some contribution to the work and I think it's very appropriate that in the acknowledgement section that you do that you do recognize those people you need to acknowledge the source of any specific equipment um, cultures or other special materials that were given to you or lent to you or you gained access to Obviously, acknowledge any outside financial assistance, such as grants and contracts and fellowships that enable um, the work to be done. And of course, be courteous. So always try to acknowledge um, the people who have, who have um, helped you and they should be uh, specifically named. Now, if, if you're going to do this uh, in terms of specifically naming people, you, you, you would be very wise to check with them first that they are happy to be acknowledged. Some people um, do, don't even want that. And I think that needs to be respected. So don't just suddenly write people's name into a paper in the acknowledgement section without uh, specifically clearing with them that they are comfortable with you, with you doing that. Uh, the, the literature, um, is also um, very important and a common area where, where there are difficulties um, with, with papers. So only use um, significant published references. And in my opinion, um, referencing abstracts is not acceptable. By and large, most abstracts have not undergone um, rigorous peer review. They're usually just abstracts of data that have been presented at uh, meetings and have not been verified by the normal scientific review and publishing process. So try not to um, reference abstracts if you can help it. Check all parts of the reference for accuracy against the original publication. Again, it, it, sounds, it sounds like an obvious thing, but even today I was reviewing a paper and there was a reference to um, one, of, one of my papers and the whole reference was wrong. Um, the authors were wrong, the title of the paper was incorrect and the journal um, reference was also incorrect. So this is a very common problem. And when, when this is picked up, the first, the first thing that I think of is if the authors cannot get the references right, they have got a serious problem of lack of attention to detail and then that makes me very concerned about the veracity and the and the and the um, how well 
the work has been done in the paper that they're presenting. So it can it, things like this can really come back to be a big a big problem if you do not pay attention to um, the the um, the smaller details. Um, check the reference style and the instructions for authors. This will be one of the very first things that uh, during the triage process, um, the editorial office will look at. If you um, submit a paper and the references aren't in the style of the journal, you'll be, you'll be getting the paper returned to you straight away to fix up that problem. So get it right the first time. There's all sorts of different types of, um, of referencing systems um, and citation processes. Fortunately now with programs like Reference Manager and EndNote, um, the referencing process is a relatively simple matter and um, it, it uh, makes it a lot easier to format the references both in the text and in the, um, in the, um, in, in the cited literature uh, in the appropriate way for the journal. Now, again, um, the use and misuse of English is a very big problem. Um, this is all, also one of the major areas where a, a paper will be immediately rejected. rejected uh, if the editor reads it and, um, and realizes that it's been very poorly written, um, that more, more often than not, the paper will be returned to the um, authors um, to either outright reject or a very significant uh, revision and for the authors to get assistance um, with, with someone that is skilled in the art of scientific writing. Making sure the grammar, the correct grammar is used, keeping the language very simple and avoiding redundancy. For example, a young juvenile or a viable alternative, authentic replicas. People tend to get very verbose when they're, when they're writing and it's a, it, it is a skill that takes a long time to learn to keep a sentence simple and accurate and to the point without using too many words. Tense in scientific writing is also um, quite important to remember. So when you're referring to previously published work, that should be referred to in the present tense because it's been published and it is established fact because it's been published. The work that you're gonna to refer to in your paper that you've done yourself has to be referred to in the past tense because it is yet to be established fact until after it's been published. So it, th these are minor things, but again, it's, it's attention to detail that's going to help uh, you get your paper, you know, sometimes through, through what can be quite a, a rigorous process. Once the paper's been written and or during the process, the decision needs to be made of where and how to submit the, the manuscript. So you need to choose a journal. There's many different factors that come into play here. Um, clearly, um, you'll be wanting to get your paper into the, the best journal that you possibly can. You may want to choose a journal that's got a very high circulation factor. You may wish to use a journal that's got a, a very high citation index factor. You may want to look at how often the journal is published. And most importantly, the relevance to the field. I can't tell you how many times I see papers submitted um, that, believe it or not, are just irrelevant to, to that particular journal. So what the authors have done is they may have picked a journal which has a high prestige factor, but unfortunately their paper is just not suitable for that journal because it's, it's of, of uh, little or no relevance to that, to that journal's field. Now the review process, uh, I, um, I think we've gone through this before in the previous presentation, but it doesn't hurt to go through this again. So you send off the manuscript and it is received in the editorial office. And generally speaking, most editorial offices will use some sort of checklist to complete um, that needs to be completed prior to forwarding it to the editor. Now, this is an example of one such checklist that um, one of the journals I work with uses. And so you can see here that the, um, this is not done by the editor, it's just done by the, um, by the uh, editorial staff. They check that the files are complete, all in the acceptable order, that they've uploaded all the right material, uh, that it's within the scope of the journal, and is it within the word limit, if there is a word limit, and all the files have, have been presented in, in the right way. And they all need to be ticked off. If they do not fulfill these criteria, this button, which is the unsubmit button, is pushed and the paper is sent back uh, to the authors 
um, with either an outright reject or a request to fix whatever problems there might be. So once it's received in the editorial office, the checklist is completed, forwarded to the editor. Once it hits the editor's desk, uh, the editor will usually make an immediate decision whether it's suitable for the general audience of the journal. And if that is the case, then it will be sent out for review. And then after the reviewer's comments are received, um, usually one of three things will be recommended by the reviewers to either reject the paper outright, um, to accept eventually accept the paper with major or minor modification, or to accept the paper outright. Um, it's very unusual that the third, third option of accept outright occurs. Very <coughs> occasionally it does. And when that does, um, that's, uh, I usually write a letter to the, to the authors and, and congratulate them on what is clearly a very fine piece of work and that they should be very happy because it's, <coughs> excuse me, extremely unusual for a paper to be uh, accepted outright with no, with no modification at all. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, the rejected manuscript is always a problem, and it's it's always very disappointing. It's disappointing for the editor to have to relay the news. So, try to remember if you do get a rejected manuscript, uh, the author, the editor's job is to try to help the authors, not to be obstructive. So, it's disappointing for an editor to have to re uh, re reject a paper, just as it's very disappointing for the author. And I think the the best way that I've always been, I rationalize this or, or share with people is to try to remember that everyone has manuscripts rejected. <coughs> Excuse me. Even me, after having published some 350 papers, I still get papers rejected. Okay. So it's not just happens to young, younger researchers or, or whatever. It happens to all of us. And when it does, we just need to move on. Remember that the editor's decision generally is final. And unless you strongly feel that there's been a serious error made in the review process, <clears throat> it's my recommendation, recommendation that you do not complain to the editor and seek resubmission. <coughs> Excuse me. There is usually a reason for the rejection and this will be relayed to you in a letter from the editor. I strongly urge you to take action on this before you res resubmit the paper to another journal. I can't tell you how many times I see a paper that comes to a journal for review that I know has already been rejected and the authors have not bothered to take on board any of the previous comments that led to the initial rejection of their paper. So as I said, there's good reasons why papers are rejected. They need to be addressed. So do yourself a favor and make sure that you try to address them before you resubmit to another journal. Now the revision process is, is, a, lot, is a lot nicer. So you'll get a paper back and the authors, uh, the editor has, has asked you to um, look at the reviewer's comments and address them and resubmit the paper. <clears throat> so you should make adjustments to the manuscript as requested. Excuse me. If you don't agree with a comment, um, then politely explain why you disagree with the um, with the comment, and therefore the requested change has not been made. Now, when you do this, just be aware that you need to nicely and politely convince the reviewer that they were wrong. And most reviewers don't like being told that. So you need to be very sure of your facts as to why <clears throat> a requested change is not, is not being made. Then finally, once you've done that, write a cover letter to the editor detailing what changes you've made <clears throat> and where in the text the changes have been made. And a, a cover letter would look something like this where you, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry about this, write to the uh, editor, refer to the manuscript, thank them for sending the reviewers comments, let the editor know that all of the authors have looked at the comments, found them useful, made the changes, then delineate the changes that you've made, and then the final concluding comments of submitting the paper. Plagiarism, um, I think was also touched in the, in the um, earlier presentation. Remember now that most journals will and do use software that will check <clears throat> for plagiarism. This is one of the more common um, uh, tech similarity checkers. 
uh, the, the editor will, uh, you, will always look at this. In this particular case, you can see that the check is coming in at, at 60%, okay? Um, and then it requires the editor to, to go through, look at where all the text similarity is and then make a decision. But 60% text similarity is, is unacceptable. Let me tell you, you do not want to get a letter that looks something like this. That's, you, dear doctor, thank you for submitting your manuscript. But a text cross-checking program has determined that there are significant portions of this work with text similarity to previous published works which exceed our accepted le levels of similarity. Test listed here. I always add this on the, on the bottom and I think it's very important to remember. In view of this, your manuscript is deemed not suitable for publication. This is an unacceptable level of text similarity and I urge you to reconsider submitting this manuscript anywhere for publication the damage that plagiarism can do to your credibility and career is insurmountable. Trust me, editors talk to each other. And if there are, if there are recalcitrant individuals who have a track record of submitting high-tech similarity papers, editors get to know about this very quickly and will develop a blacklist of those people. You don't want to be on that list. Now, having done that, I just wanted to move a little bit. Again, this was touched in the previous presentation. I'm sorry, but hopefully I've got some, some new things to add here as well on how to review a manuscript for a journal. The elements of peer review um, go such that the, you will receive an invitation to review a, man, a manuscript, and generally the abstract is provided to help you decide whether you have the expertise, interest, and time to review that, pa that paper. So then the peer review and recommendation process is undertaken. The editorial review and decision is, um, is also undertaken and then re-review and further recommendations are made. And then there's a final decision by the editor. So that's basically how the peer review process works. The elements of the peer review are, two, are twofold. One usually is that there will be some space provided for comments to the editors, which remain confidential and are not released to the authors. And then there's a second section where you'll provide comments for the authors, and these are sent to the authors. Remember that the most helpful review is one that's going to articulate the strengths of the paper, what you like about it, while also clearly identifying some of the limitations of the manuscript that can be addressed in a, in a revision. Now, the confidential comments for the editors are, 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 will usually incorporate um, a checklist um, with a yes, no scale uh, in the process and then space for more, more detailed comments to the editor. So this is an example of a journal that has a questionnaire, um, yes, no answers uh, to things such as, you know, does the manuscript contain new and significant information, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, going through this checklist the authors never see this information, but this is important for the editor, which helps them determine the quality of the paper and whether or not eventually it is something that they would want to consider for publication in their journal. Then there will be the box where you can also provide some text. So you might say, look, this is a really outstanding paper. I enjoyed reading it and I um, look forward to seeing revision or whatever. Or you could also write something in here that said this is this is really a very bad study uh, it's fundamentally flawed because of x y and z and then you can give it a rating here so this that's just an example of what one of one journal process looks like but most journals uh, have fairly similar sorts of processes um, and then it goes in here um, you can do a, a recommendation. Now, for those of you who are familiar with this process, can I just make one comment here? I mean, the recommendation process is quite simple. You either recommend accept the paper, recommend minor revision, major revision, or reject. Now, I can't tell you how many times people hit the reject button, but then write in here that they look forward to seeing a revision. Reject means reject. That means you don't want to see the paper again. It's really bad, and the editor will should seriously consider reject. And major and minor revision are they? They're the manuscripts that you would would be willing to uh, re-review again, uh, should the authors decide to submit a revision. Now, when you come to write the review, the importance of the paper is going to be judged by the strength of the science and the results. 
and whether it contains, again, original ideas. We don't really want to be seeing papers that are just redoing what's already been done. Re for, for those of you who are doing this, um, have not done a lot of reviewing, you, you will find that you need to read the whole manuscript the first time before making any, any, any formal response or whatever, <clears throat> and to get a first impression of the manuscript. <clears throat> Excuse me, and determine whether it's how well it's written, how clear it is, English grammar, the general presentation, general concepts. So the goals uh, is the problem that's being stu um, studied. Is it clearly articulated? Are the goals and hypothesis clearly stated? The methods look for evaluating the adequacy and clarity of the of the uh, methods used, the design, the procedures. Ethics is very important to make sure that that, that has all been, been ticked off. What types of analyses have been done? Are the statistics adequate? If, the stati if you're not sure about the statistics, there's nothing wrong in writing back to the editor and saying that um, you feel uncomfortable assessing the statistics because it's beyond your area of expertise and recommend that the journal undertake a statistical review as well. Many journals have got editors on their board who are on there for the sole purpose of evaluating the statistics of, <clears throat> of, a, of a study. Look for power analyses in studies that are using um, um, human, human subjects to make sure that the, that the um, sample sizes are big enough. Then the limitations <coughs> would be absence of controls, confounding factors that really make it very difficult to understand the results or, or what they mean, and inadequate statistical analyses. And of course, sample sizes which are which are, are too small. For example, again, I was reviewing another paper today. Sample sizes of fifty in a in a test and control group. The results were that they found no difference between the two. But one of the reasons for that being that is, I think that the sample sizes were way too small to detect what probably are quite small small differences between the two groups. The results must be clearly presented. You must be able to easily understand the results. Uh, and this comes back to the clarity of their presentation. The statistics have to be appropriate. The important findings should be summarized in tables and then less important findings in the text. And then finally, the discussion um, is judged by the ability of the authors to frame and interpret the main findings from their study, to present them nice and clearly, to honestly assess the strengths and limitations of the research. And this is a, um, can sometimes be a bit difficult to actually put into a paper um, what you think the limitations of your research are, but that can be a very useful paragraph to, to put into a discussion. Um, and make sure that the discussion and the conclusions are supported by the manuscript's findings. Again, it's a very common mistake um, of some authors to make conclusions that are simply not supported by, by the data presented in the, in the study. And if that's the case, uh, that will usually be grounds for rejection of the paper. And along the same lines, over-interpretation of the data is also a very common weakness of, of many manuscripts. So don't try to make too much out of the data, just present them as they are and interpret them in the light of the current literature. The abstract, has to reflect what is in the manuscript. You can't have different um, findings or methods in the abstract compared to the, um, the body of the text. It needs to be formatted correctly. And again, the references check that they're relevant. Are they adequate? Are any important references missing? Too much self-citing is a big problem for some, uh, some in some papers where authors almost refer solely to all of their own studies without um, citing other important studies in the field and make sure that the reference have been formatted correctly. So formatting the reviewer's comments for the author, usually you would make some general comments. So here you would just describe the intent and value of the manuscript as you understand it, note any strengths and limitations, and then list um, specific comments critiquing the whole paper from the in, from the introduction through the methods, results, discussion, and, and the references. And then this will give the, a very clear and useful framework for the authors to, to respond. Some problems in the review process. Um, remember that the final decision concerning publication belongs to the editor. So 
it is inappropriate in your reviewer comments to the author to make any recommendations for re acceptance or rejection. So you make those comments to the editor, but you do not convey those recommendations to the authors because it becomes a very big problem then for the editor, should they decide the papers to be rejected and you've written in the comments to the authors that this is a not bad paper and deserves to be published. So you create quite a big problem for the editor with comments like that. Conflict of interest. If you have a conflict of interest, you should not review the paper. So when the paper and abstract request are sent to you, if you believe you have a conflict of interest, then you should uh, uh, decline um, um, reviewing that paper. And do not put inflammatory comments in the comments to the authors. Always think if whatever you write, would you be happy to receive those comments? So no, do not ever write anything like, this is the worst paper I have ever read, which I've seen in comments to, to authors. And also the authors clearly do not understand their field. These are inflammatory and hurtful comments that are inappropriate and should never be used in any, in any correspondence to um, an author. So reviewing a manuscript for a journal, just remember that a thoughtful review is a, is a, a very important gift of your expertise, your time, and your careful consideration of the paper. And that gift is not just for the authors, not just the editors, but also eventually the readers of, of that paper that you have had the privilege of reviewing for a, for a journal. So on, on that note, <clears throat> um, I'd like to thank you for your, um, for your time. Again, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity of, of sharing um, some of these thoughts with you. And I hope that that has been of, of, um, of some, some help and interest to, to you all. So um, thank you very much. And I'll uh, try thank to- Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mark Haidt. Uh, thank you, thank you very much uh, uh, for the for the wonderful lecture, uh, and more importantly for your time, which you so readily agreed, uh, you know, on a simple request from us. And uh, honestly, you know, COVID has done a lot of uh, things which we are not proud of, but but one of yeah. the things certainly is it has made us so amenable uh, to a digital mode of interaction, and probably you know that is why uh, we have been able to pull out pull you out of your, your busy schedule. Otherwise, you know, having you to travel uh, to India for interacting with yeah. us would have been almost impossible uh, thing to do. Uh, but but thank you so much for such a wonderful presentation. And I remember, you know, we, we go along back uh, when you had visited India in 2004, I believe, and we traveled all over the country, you know, they put it everywhere and had wonderful interactions with you at that time. Uh, but but you really dealt with the topic uh, in a very lucid manner, I must say, uh, to the benefit of all the all, all the senior academicians uh, sitting here. I'm sure everyone uh, would would really have something to take back. Uh, there are certainly few questions, so if you allow us, can we put some questions to you on that? Sure. Thank, Thank you. Uh, so one of the issues, one of the questions that has come to us is, you know how to decide between who would be the first author and who would be the corresponding author. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, that's actually not that, not that difficult in, in a way. Um, the first author really is going to be, um, you know, the person who, who did the bulk of the work. Sometimes, you know, in, in, the, in, in the past in my lab, you know, I've had perhaps two people that have worked side by side on a project. And then we just the journals will accept if you asterisk those people and just say that they're that they're listed as co as co first authors. Um, that's one way of getting around that 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 problem. The issue of the corresponding author, um, I think that's really just something that needs to be worked out with the authors themselves. Um, sometimes the corresponding author will be the, the you know the the last person on the paper who's really the you know the the, the person that's running the whole the whole program, if if you like, um, only because of their experience and um, and likely that they understand the field. Should any uh, any correspondence um, come in, one comment I would make about that is to also is quite often when 
if the corresponding author is likely to move on um, from you know one place to another, then that becomes a problem in the years to come trying to track that person that person down. But um, really, I, I think that the issue of the senior first author is is critical. The corresponding author should should be um, a, able to be sorted out relatively simply and, and amicably. I would have I would have thought, but I don't have any set any set set rules on, on that. I mean, if if somebody, I mean, m many of my papers, you know, co-authored papers, <clears throat> you know, I am the corresponding author, but if somebody said to me, look, I want to be the corresponding author, well, fine, you know, it doesn't really, wouldn't, wouldn't really bother me. Yeah, but, but, but as, as you are saying, I think it makes sense uh, for the person who's going to be staying, uh, you know, there in the lab for long should be the yeah. one who should be answering any further yeah. correspondence. So for for example, you know, when you were in Boston and if you were the corresponding author and now I want to try and find you, it's going to be difficult. But if Dr. Van Dyke was the corresponding author or or, or Alf yeah. and they're yeah. still there, well then they may they may well know where you are and and so things can hook up. So there is some sense in in um, in the head of the lab or whoever is the last author of being the um, being the contact person. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Uh, another question that we have got is, you know, the details of the methodology. You mentioned that the details of methodology uh, should not be really too much elaborated in the paper. Uh, if it is, it is the first time reporting. If it is my own methodology, understandable. You know, we will probably explain it in detail. But if we are duplicating somebody else's methodology, so would it suffice to just reference that and leave it there to keep the paper short? Yeah, I think if if the method's already been published elsewhere, then you know a, a sentence you know along the lines of you know we we did this according to the method of whoever reference forty seven. Um, there's no point in going into into huge huge detail unless you've modified it some way. So you know we we use the the as described by by Smith et al. But modified as such. Uh, so I think that that's really really all, all you need to do without going into into too much detail if it's easily accessible. Perfect. Uh, one of the questions is that is the plagiarism similarity index score varies with type of software used. Uh, or author should use the same software with the journal. Uh, well, for that um, authenticate, I think would be quite expensive for people to access. So what I I, I just use Turnitin for all my own papers. So prior prior to submission, I always just run the paper through Turnitin um, to get a, and that seems to to work. There are many other programs, um, but that that works very well for me. And then then you feel um, certainly confident that that's not going to, going to be a, an issue. The um, I, I don't think that there's a lot of difference in between the programs, but I, I don't know that um, for a fact. Um, so it just happens that Wiley, who is one of the main journals that I deal with, that's the package that that they that they use. Mm -hmm. Uh, one more question is that you know, there is a lot of push on the systematic review and meta-analysis and the things like that. Uh, we tend to do a lot of that, you know, as, as a group, a lot of people tend to do a lot of that. Uh, but yeah. do you so, think Sorry, what's the question? The, the question essentially is that should should we be putting in our time and energy okay. on, a, well, on writing a systematic review or meta-analysis? Okay. I'll give you a very honest but personal opinion. And yeah. opinion is the lowest form of evidence, okay? Yes. <laughs> I, but but, but getting, coming from you, it matters a lot. Actually. I'm getting a little bit tired of systematic review reviews. Um, it's a it's very soft way of, of people getting, getting publications. And now we're seeing systematic reviews on all manner of stupid things with the conclusion being there's not enough evidence and we need more studies. Well, I, I, don't, I don't need to read a whole paper um, to, to find that, con that conclusion. I mean, I think really good systematic reviews that are published by Cochrane, you know, those, those sorts of things, they are useful. I, I can tell you that having just come off as, as editor of the Journal of the International Academy of Perio, we were getting just 
almost overload of, of systematic reviews. Now, I understand why that's happening, because in, in some of the developing countries, it's impossible to do expensive laboratory or even clinical research. But anyone can do a systematic review if they've got access to a library and, and databases. So from that point of view, I, I understand completely their desire to try to do some research as part of a training program or whatever. But eventually, I think that their usefulness is, is really a, a little bit limited. Now, that's not to say we don't do them, but I think we've got to choose, pick and choose and make sure they're done on, on good, good topics, relevant topics, and, and hopefully try to get something that's going to be, have, have a useful conclusion for us. Right. Or maybe limit it to, to be to only on invitation days. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Mark. I think that's, that's uh, all that we have to ask. And I really was can't thank you enough for the time that you have put in for us uh, and the wonderful interaction that we have had from you. Uh, we really look forward to more such interactions, if not physical, then certainly you know, more of digital meetings with you. Yeah, well, I, and I think, thank you. And I think it's a nice initiative that you've tried to do to, by linking me and out, you know, through the IAP to this. I, um, I, I hope people can sort of you know, see some exposure for the IAP and, and how, I think we have a long history going back with the Indian society. So um, hopefully we can, can you know, build on that. But no, it was a pleasure. I, I, I must say I find these sorts of presentations quite difficult to give because you can't, you can't get any feedback from the audience. Whereas if you're on a stage and you're talking to people, you can get a feel that you are you engaging with them or not. So I think... Um, anyone that does these sorts of presentations knows what I'm talking about. You really, yeah. you sort of go through the motions of the presentation, but um, you just hope you can still deliver some enthusiasm for the topic out through a computer screen. <laughs> but, but, but I, but I can, I can tell you, you know, from the numbers, we had still have 107 uh, listeners yeah. logged in here and an equal Lovely. number on the okay. YouTube. Uh, yeah. So that essentially goes on to say that it was a very, very engaging talk and, and a wonderful presentation. We really enjoyed every bit of it. Okay. Thank you well, very so, much, Martin. Thank, thank you very much, again. and I uh, just say goodbye to everybody, and uh, keep 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 safe and keep well, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. Thank All you. Right very much. Thank right. you goodbye. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, all the participants. Uh, you know we have had wonderful interaction. So also ask your postgraduates to join us in the evening, uh, wherein uh, Professor Abdogan Kentachi. Uh, who's the current editor of Journal of IAP, executive director of IAP at one point in time, and also working as a professor at Forsyth Harvard Institute, uh, who would be speaking, and you know, I would be pitching in a little bit there, and we would be talking essentially on, on MDS and the research component to it. So please ask your postgraduates to, to register if they have not. Ashish Kumar, thank you very much for, for your time and, and the wonderful presentation. Also. Thank you so thank much. You, sir. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.